I suck at jujitsu. How do I suck less? Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to the newest episode of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. So today, I have a special guest for us, uh, and maybe even a controversial topic, as you guys love. Uh, so today I have uh, Robert Drysdale. If you guys do not know Robert Drysdale, um, a very OG competitor of Jiu-Jitsu, we kind of get into that a little bit, uh, but when I started training, this guy would have probably been at his peak or, or very close to it. And uh, I got to see him compete at a really high level against the best guys in the world. And um, something interesting about him, he's got, uh, he is uh, half Brazilian, half American, and has been training jujitsu for 26 years. And in that time, he's also um, become or been a very uh, big history buff and so he released a book not long ago called opening the clothes guard and it was about um where jujitsu came from and then he released a new book and um it is really it's about the rise of jujitsu and he also to me i think the biggest thing that this book is about is giving credit uh, to Carlson Gracie for his contributions to jiu-jitsu and I think that that's what this interview we really dig into and so there are definitely some historical things that we talk about that may offend people uh, that people may go hey that's not the story that I heard I encourage you to one uh, something was really cool about about Robert Drysdale was he was just so willing to go hey if you don't agree we'll just talk about that and um, you know we'll just you know, it's like, I don't, I don't mind sharing my opinion in the book. I feel like he doesn't share near as much of opinion. He really just tries to be a historian in the book. But, uh, you know, in this episode, he, he gives me a little more of his opinion on, on kind of what we should be looking at from history of jujitsu. And, um, I, I really think that he does a great job getting that point across. Of course, as always, anytime I'm getting to talk to a high level guy, I'm going to ask about training method. I'm going to ask about getting better at jujitsu, just how it goes. Right. Uh, but the big takeaways for me are just especially the cultural um, things that are um, he talks about like the cultural contributions of Carlson Gracie Sr. And I think, and, and his school. And I think for us, uh, getting to, getting to see that, getting to hear about that, um, and then getting to compare it to 2023 Granite City, where I'm teaching jujitsu. And he talks about the culture and I'm like, man, that, that culture isn't very far off from what, what culture we have now. And so it was really cool to kind of find out that history. Um, if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to let us know. Be sure to let uh, Mr. Drysdale know uh, and definitely check out this book. I read it. I generally am an audiobook only guy, and now it's on Audible. So I could see me using one of my Audible credits uh, on this book. It, it's that good. It's really, it's a very enjoyable book that's about history and i don't think that i have ever read one of those before and so that's all i have for you guys today let's go ahead and jump in to today's episode robert drysdale how are you doing today i'm doing great thanks for having me how are you doing I'm doing good, man. We kind of just off camera got to mention a little bit of the craziness of the weekend doing Master Worlds Jiu Jitsu Con. Plus, you had a tournament on top of that. Yeah, I had that. I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was a great idea or the dumbest idea ever. I'm still like debating, but I figure that out of 10,000 competitors at Jiu Jitsu Con, 5,000 will lose first fight. So, you know, why not do a tournament on the Sunday? You know, so people travel from Australia, Brazil, Japan, Europe. They get a second chance on Sunday. And we had we did this the same thing in March, and we had double the number of competitors this Sunday. So um, I think it's going to grow. People just got to hear about it. But, um, yeah, we're, we're in a tournament on the Sunday after Jiu-Jitsu Con from now on. So hopefully it works. What was the rule set? 
Uh, IBJJF. I have a I have a super fight rule set where we have jiu-jitsu with strikes, uh, like old school, like, like top, not taparia, not like combat jiu-jitsu with the open hand strikes, but strikes to the ground next to the head where you score points that way. So the idea is to is to bring you know, force people to practice jujitsu as close as possible to a real fight. So not to sit in positions where you would get hit, but to move in positions where you could potentially get hit, so you don't have points scored on you. Okay, okay. So how many? But that's but that's a su- but that's a super fight only. The, the 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 tournament itself is IBJJF rule set. Um, we've had about 120, which is not a huge number, but it's you know it's our second one, so yeah, much better than the first. So I'm I, I'm I'm very confident it's going to grow. I like that. I like that. Any tough competitors that you had there? Uh, lots of kids, mostly kids. So uh, we have white and blue belt division. We had a couple of purple, uh, uh, a couple of purple belt divisions, you know, but you know, it's, it's still in its early stages, but it's, it's going to grow up. We just got to get the word out there. Nice. Nice. So I wanted to start this interview, um, kind of, it was very similar to where you started your new book. Um, you had, I want to say it was master worlds 2022, you had a conversation with Carlson Gracie Jr. And could you share just some of the context around that conversation and how it kind of inspired you uh, to to start on y- your new book? Um, yeah, well, you know, the, the conversation with Carlson Jr. was like uh, exactly was this time of the year, right after the event. And I was becoming more aware of the, the importance of Carlson. You know, I, I mean, Carlson has always been my favorite, Gracie, for a variety of reasons. I remember when I started training, his students were the most dominant fighters in both sport, jiu-jitsu, and MMA. So, like, man, this guy must be doing something right. And he just kind of, you know, he just struck me as, like, someone, like a very simple, humble, down-to-earth kind of guy. And I, I really liked that about him. Despite his result and reputation, he still was a very simple human. But I didn't know that much about him. But, you know, getting involved in this history, I got to see how important he was. And the, the original is funny because the original suggestion, and there's a footnote in the book about this, was not, I mean, I the first time I, I well, what got me into this whole thing was reading Shockey by Roberto Pedreira, right? And the first time I read those books, I had missed that. The second time I'd read them, I had missed it. But Pedreira made a comment in, in one of the, you know, private conversation where he mentioned that if you read Shockey volume two and three carefully, carefully, uh, about two thirds of it is about Carlson, and that was like one of those eureka moments. So, like, I mean, I completely missed that. There's no such thing as history of jiu-jitsu from 1950s all the way to Hoist Gracie without talking about Carlson. Carlson is like his; he is that piece of history. It's all—I mean, it's all around him. You know, he's the centerpiece during that crucial moment of jiu-jitsu history, and it got kind of put a lid on, you know, for political reasons. So, I had Carlson in the back of my mind this this whole time. I was like, man, this guy did so much for jiu-jitsu and such an interesting character. Why don't, I mean, you're not even, you don't even know anything about him, you know? And I thought that was so unfair because I think jujitsu is lacking good role models. And I think Carlson is someone, you know, someone to look up to, you know, for what he did, his, his, his kindness, his commitment, his uh, coaching style, like all these things about really, you know, I was drawn to Carlson. And I remember talking to uh, his son, Carlson Jr., at the Masters Worlds, and he gave me one of my favorite quotes from the book. And he goes, Have you ever watched that movie, The Lion King? When the name Mufasa is mentioned and everyone just runs in fear, it's like, yeah, it's the same with my dad. And it's not too far from the truth, man. A lot of people out there, when you say Carlson, they kind of look away and they don't want to talk about it, you know, because this is the guy that opened jiu-jitsu up for everyone to train. You know, he didn't care if your last name was Grace or not. He, he he coached people and he trained people according to, you know, their, their, their talents, their efforts, their merits, and not based on whether they're family members or not. You know, and the many family members took that as treason. You know, how could you coach someone to beat your family members? It's like, man, if you want jujitsu to grow, we can't keep it this internal little family thing. We have to expand it. And he put his foot down and he basically declared war on his family so we could have jujitsu today. So it's ironic that so many people make a living from jujitsu because of him today, right? They make a living because he, he was the lead responsible for opening it up. Yet, you know, the same people who make a comfortable living from what his efforts refuse to give him any credit. They just look away and act like, you know, he wasn't there and he's barely mentioned. And, and if, if you watch like members of the Gracie family themselves, like they very rarely talk about Carlson. They almost try to avoid him completely, but the facts are there. You know, you could read Shockey. The, 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 if you can go over these newspaper articles and if you dig like 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that's all you get is Carlson Gracie. 
mm-hmm. you know, but it it got they they put a lid on it, you know, and I and I think it was it was with ill intent to you know by a lot of everyone you know did that, but a lot of people didn't uh, it purposely avoided giving Carlson his due credit. <clears throat> Would you say? Um, cause I did have a, you know, a question for kind of later. Um, but it was more about what is in your opinion, um, what would be the biggest piece of misinformation when it comes to the history of jujitsu out there? Would it be the, the lack of understanding of Carlson's, um, you know, what he brought to jujitsu? What well, um, the biggest takeaway <clears throat> was, was realizing acknowledging the, the importance of the figueredo jamagalian's academy it's something i had completely missed in the first book i missed them way after that it was when i started talking to these guys and they started describing because in the first book i described the importance of you know the brazilian mannerisms and culture and the surf culture and the rocks and that was a huge part of why brazilian jiu-jitsu grew it wasn't just the techniques it was i mean the mark the marketing the ufc certainly but for you to keep coming back, you have to be in an environment where you feel at home. And the, the laid back mannerisms was very at odds with like, you know, judo and other traditional martial arts. It was very Brazilian like. But what I had missed is that that one had a very specific birthplace. And that was not the original Gracie Academy. That was born inside Carlson's Academy by the hands of Carlson Gracie and his younger brother Hollis and or Rolls, you know, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Trying to pronounce it like Americans or Brazilians. Right? Yeah. But they get corrected by Brazilians all the time. It's Hollis, not Rolls. I'm like, okay, Hollis. But um, I was I was reading it Rolls when I was reading the book, knowing the Portuguese yeah. pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, Brazilians will correct you right away, especially the ones that knew him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, and there was something different about that environment. It was very clear. You know, these are these were it was a young crowd. They Brazil was under a dictatorship at the time, so it was there was a lot of repression. So these guys wanted to grow their hair long. They wanted to smoke weed. They wanted to show up in flip flops, you know, acai after practice, board shorts, surf, girls, you know. So it was it was an environment that I recognized that I I came to like you know see all over the world. I saw it in Japan. I see it in Australia. I see it in Europe. I see it all over the United States, Canada. Everywhere I go, I see that. And I I think there's a little bit of that that academy that made its way through into every jujitsu academy in the world. And you know, it's not something that was born inside the Gracie Academy. It was born inside Carlson's Academy, you know. And I think that's something that a lot of people missed, even like these old timers seem to have missed. And that's very important because the culture is a very important factor in all this. You know, in methodological terms, Jiu Jitsu was also born inside the Figueiredo de Magalhães Academy because these are the guys who are going to war on the mats, group classes every day. Now, we take group classes for granted. Like, yeah, sure, group classes, we go to war every day. I try to beat you, you try to beat me. The Grace Academy did not have group classes. All they did was private lessons in the, in the, in the shape of foreign, uh, a self-defense. It was self-defense and uh, private lessons. They didn't have group classes. Now, that's said that when you tell, when you say that, it sounds like, no, that's impossible. No, you talk, the members of the Gracie family are telling you this. This is not controversial. No one's disputing it. But it goes to show that in methodological terms, the model that was taught, that was used inside the Gracie Academy was not something that really took off. I mean, you have very few gyms in this country that follow that model. Right, the ninety-nine percent of people who call themselves jiu-jitsu practitioners are following the model that was born inside the Figueiredo de Magalhães Academy. So, in methodological and cultural terms, you get that. In technical terms, you also get a jiu-jitsu that was born inside the Figueiredo Academy. Why? Once you create the environment, the competitive environment within a given framework, in this case, the rule set, you're going to have evolution in a very specific direction, which more or less led us to where we are today. You know, so these guys were practicing under that rule set. Granted, with some other cultural differences we can talk about later, some things that changed over time, you know, and it became excessively sportive in a way that these guys would have not had accepted in the 70s and 80s in Brazil. But nonetheless, brought us to where we are now, a very specific brand of jiu-jitsu that has very little to do with the grace of self-defense system. I mean, really nothing when you think about it. So um, so I argue in the book that the brand of jiu-jitsu that took the world by storm after Hoist was born inside Carlson's Academy. And I find it very difficult to like anyone to argue against that because, you know, it's it's obvious, it's culturally completely different, methodologically it's completely different, the techniques are completely different. Like what there are more way more differences than similarities here, you know. So I think that was the big, um, I mean, that's the main point of the book. I think that, I think that's the that's it's. I mean, I, I, I hope it was a contribution. Some people may disagree, but that was my my attempt at you know making a contribution, even though. Again, I can't give myself more credit than I'm due. Like, 
a lot of my work was because of Roberto Pedreira and Shockey. I couldn't have done it without. He did the heavy lifting when it comes to research. So a lot of the credit goes to him. No doubt. So that, man, there's so many places to kind of go uh, from there. I think that I, I let's, let's first go with what a little more specifically um, what that training and culture at um at Carlson's gym actually looked like because the way you describe it in the book is um for context this show is half interviews and half solo episodes but the main focus of the show is um getting better at jujitsu it is uh you know is jujitsu training method jujitsu progression something that was really interesting when reading the 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 first couple chapters of the book and you start describing what the culture was and how the culture kind of dictated the training method. Um, yeah. A lot of the new ideas on training method in jujitsu that I am running into that I'm finding other people it sounded like they even came from this Academy. A lot of these ideas yeah. on, on how it was trained. So could you give us uh paint a little bit of picture about how jujitsu was trained in, um, in, in the original Academy? So, Carlson was a fanatic about cockfighting. A lot of people don't didn't know this, you know, but I, that was his inspiration. He just he just loved competition. Everyone who knew him described him as someone who was fanatical about competition. He just loved like that, like, you know, warrior versus warrior. And that's what he wanted. So much so that for him to have an army of warriors inside his gym, he didn't even charge most students. This guy was doing it for free. He died broke. Carlson died like you know, with like, you know, a few hundred bucks in his account. He never had, a, he never had open property. He never had money. All the money he made in his fights, and there were many fights where he made big money, went to the family, right? When his father died, he didn't keep the inheritance. He kept nothing. He was like, he was not, he was not interested in money. He was just interested in getting it done. He just wanted war. He wanted a competition because, and, and, and a lot of people from that era would say, oh, he was not so technical, you know, because he was already, you know, in his 50s, 60s. And it's easier for you to call someone not technical when they're not in their prime, you know, as you age. But that to me, first of all, it's not true. I have a picture of Carlson doing an omoplata in 1954. I've never seen an omoplata before, like before, like the 1980s. Like in 1954, this guy's doing omoplata in an MMA fight. You know, so, you know, you watch his fight with Valdemar Santana. He's hitting Uchimata's left and right. Find me a judoka that can hit an Uchimata left and right. Go, I'll wait. Even a judoka, most judokas can't do it. Even elite judokas can't do that. You know, so this guy was very technical. So that's BS. But it's not even that important. That part to me is the less important part. The important part is that he created the environment for jujitsu to evolve. Now, there's a myth in martial arts. I call it the, the genius myth, right? Or the myth of the genius. Um, it, it, it's it's the idea that this really smart guy is going to sit back in a corner, watch people train, and then he's going to go back home and think about all these positions, and he's going to tell his students what to do next day. It's a myth. It's a myth. Anyone who believes that, I'm sorry, you don't understand cop fighting. You don't. I don't want to offend people, but it's simply not true, right? I've been in fighting my whole life, and I'm going to tell you, innovation comes from accidents and improvisation. It doesn't come from people thinking of the comfort of their bed or on the edge of the mats. That that's it's just nonsense. It comes from improvisation, right, and accidents, trial and error. You go to war, you make mistakes, you learn how not to do something, you improve on the technique incrementally. The more people in the environment, the more competitive the environment, the stronger the selection pressures. So at the original Gracie Academy, they had like four or five people at the end of the day training amongst themselves, right? Some selection pressures, but not a lot, right? And imagine, imagine me and you on an island, you know, just training jiu-jitsu every day. We didn't even know what jiu-jitsu was, but, you know, someone gives us a tablet with this rule set, the IBJJF rule set, right, for example. And me, we end up rolling there for 40, 50 years every day. We end up reaching the conclusion of a De La Hiva. People don't have to teach us De La Hiva, but we would reach that conclusion over time, you know. But it would take us a long time for us to reach a lot of the conclusions we have today, year, decades, you know, centuries, because it's only two people, right? So a small group with a very, with very small competitive pressure is not going to lead to a lot of evolution. However, if you have a large group of people with very strong competitive, very strong competitive environment, that's going to accelerate. So instead of an island with two people, now imagine an island with like five hundred thousand people competing every weekend. All five hundred thousand of them. What kind of selection pressures do you get? You accelerate it tremendously, right? And this is true in biology. This is true in jujitsu. So what Carlson did is he created that environment. 
he created an environment for people. Like, you're welcome. Everyone's welcome. It's democratized, but in a very sort of aristocratic kind of way. Like, you have to be a Spartan to survive in here. If you're like, oh, I'm going to cry because I'm injured, get out. This is why, like, a lot of people that were softer didn't make it because it was not an environment for soft people. There's a reason why jiu-jitsu didn't, you know, grow to all demographics in the 80s in Brazil. It was a practice for Spartans. You're going to have to deal with the intensity. Don't be a bitch. You know, like, you didn't get to cry, complain, you know. Like, it was it was a tough man kind of world. And that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. But that's what jiu-jitsu needed, A, to gain credibility, the credibility that I make a living from today, that we're all enjoying that credibility because of those guys. We didn't do it. They did it. Right, and the, the generation that preceded Hoist, those are the guys that created that 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 sort of like combat mentality that jiu-jitsu needed for it to grow around the world. It's like we have the greatest martial art in the world. That I call the second wave generation. Those guys did it, right? And um, and I think that that's the that's the 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 key factor here is like that environment for evolution to take place was created by Carlson, and that's his greatest contribution. It's not insignificant, and it's very important. Because without that, there's no evolution. And then without evolution, you think Hoist would have won? You think that I would be here? Like, I mean, you think we would have enough missionaries to colonize the world after Hoist brought Jiu-Jitsu into prominence? No way. We would have had, I mean, so the seeds were were, were planted by Carlson back in the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I like to say that he created the recipe for the cake. And then, you know, in the mid-90s, Carlos Gracie Jr., Marcelo Siriam, Andre Fernandez, the IBJJF guys, they... They created the oven for the for the for the recipe to for the cake to to really grow to its proportion. But when I'm walking around Jiu-Jitsu Con, and I was thinking about that man, I was like, "This is Carlson's vision. This is all. This is what he had envisioned all along. This was his vision for Jiu-Jitsu: democratize it, open it up. You know, open it up to everyone. We need everyone practicing. We need more tournaments. He was fanatic about competition. This guy was running illegal underground tournaments in Brazil because at the time you couldn't run tournaments unless you had green light by the federation who was ran by helio so helio was very controlling he didn't like out things outside of his control carlson would really like literally get together with other gyms and run underground tournaments because he felt that there were not enough tournaments going on in rio at the time so so like the, i mean the more you learn about the stories like man this is the guy who did it we're here because this is the effort to democratize it to expand it to set on a completely new evolutionary track it was created by him you know, and, and and if you talk to his students, man, they, they're like, yeah, we know that. We know that. They've all been saying it all along. But, you know, I guess, you know, it was just not something that most of these guys do would say, tell their students this, but it never got it out there. So I think the book has that purpose of trying to get that information out there, man. Like this is, you know, you can, there's no such thing as the history of jiu-jitsu without Carlson, you know, especially the brand of jiu-jitsu that we're practicing today. Have you gotten a lot of blowback from the book so far? Here's here's what I got from the first and second. I don't know how many people disliked it. My from my I I get I knew I made a lot of friends. You know, when I started this, I thought I was going to make I knew I was going to make a lot of enemies. But I don't know how many enemies I made because they don't write me, they don't talk to me. They might trash me behind my back. Maybe they read the book. Maybe they didn't. My 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 take on it is they most people who don't like the book didn't read it mm -hmm. so their opinion doesn't count you know like i mean there are some people who wrote me privately and they pointed out things that disagree with and i i, I mean i'm always replied if they're polite about them or it's like yeah and, and and some people have been right they pointed out things like oh you're right man i should have said that word of that differently you know i don't i don't mind criticism but i made a lot more a lot more friends than than i really thought i i would you know like i literally so many people like not a day goes by someone doesn't write me privately and go, thank you for that. I love the book. I'd love to meet you in person. Like, I met, like, a lot of, like, university professors that read my book and trained jiu-jitsu. And they wrote me, like, oh, man, what you said there, that's my area. And I end up, like, exchanging emails with them. Out. It's, like, so many cool people, man, so came from this. So no regrets, you know, no regrets. But I'm sure some people are upset. But at the same time, you know, I don't think that they're that upset because I don't think people care that much. Most people at least don't care about legacy. Yeah. I think they care about their political and financial standing more than anything. And as long as I'm not messing with their pockets or political standing, they kind of don't give a shit, really. That's mm -hmm. that's that's my impression, most people. Um, I mean, there might be someone that feels that I'm attacking the the this or that. But if you read the books carefully, a very 
there's a lot of compliments to what you know members of mm -hmm. the Gracie family does. I mean, there's I think it's more positive to the Gracie family than negative. I mean, the critiques are mainly things that are on the record. They're not really my opinion. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they attacked Manuel Rufino dos Santos, you know, when like the three of them together, man, like that's not okay. You know, it's on the record. I mean, get yeah. mad at me if you want. There's the, you'll get mad at them who did it, not me. They'll shoot the messenger. But I think that people take that as an attack. It's like, oh, I'm just stating the facts, you know. But I, I think it, it, at the very least it goes to show like what kind of mentality these guys had then, you know. And and in some ways it was maybe it was maybe it did the job, you know, because if we're not for that, maybe we wouldn't be here now. Of course. But uh, yeah, we definitely made some enemies, I think. But I think I made a lot more allies than anything. And I know I was coming from a good place. I didn't come from a place of hatred or mm -hmm. jealousy or destruction, you know, anything destructive. It was, I know I was coming from a good place. And I, I, I've always been, I think that, you know, whatever good happens to be, it comes from the truth, right? Whatever evil happens to be, it starts with lying, you know? And I, I believe that the origin of good things is, is reality, is the truth. That's how you, you don't start with fake things. You start with reality. You start with the truth, the facts, and then from that you can probably build something good. But I don't think you can build something good with with false premises, you know. And 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 to me, that's always been crystal clear. So when I started these this right when I wrote these books, I, I really had that in, in the back of my mind, and and I think that's still you know how I think. So I don't I don't think I did anything that wasn't from coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. I I agree. Even even through reading uh, it, I knew you were um going to be giving opinions that of course people certain people are not going to like or not going to agree with but i really thought i thought the word you used was good you it didn't come from a place of destruction it didn't yeah. come from the place of i'm going to prove everybody wrong or anything like this it was it seemed very simple to me of like i'm going to try to tell the truth in the best ability that I have. And uh, I really, for me, I don't enjoy many books and I really, really enjoyed um, the entire book. Just really enjoyed the whole history of the art that I dedicate my life to. And so it was really cool to, to get that. Um, at one point you said that uh, Carlson was a, a, a great jujitsu role model. And you said there are not many of those. And I agree. There are not, many jujitsu role models um are there any other habits that he had things that he had and and you kind of touched on the uh you know his generosity and his uh in things um but are there just any other things to note uh, about this guy in jujitsu history that uh we could take away from him as a role model so when i want to talk about his generosity or the fact that he let people train for free i'm not glorifying financial martyrdom i'm not saying you should be poor i like money i'm not stupid okay i mean i charge my students i mean over the years i probably missed out on hundreds of thousands of dollars of people like well let's train for free but you know so i'm somewhere in between i guess you know but i think carson should have charged people i think he was wrong but i think the fact that he let homeless people sleep in his gym and that's another one of people he would literally i learned that's one really like oh you don't understand because people that read his book and knew him and were from that generation, they would reach out to me. They've been reaching out to me like, bro, there's more. This guy would literally open his gym and let homeless people sleep on the mats. I mean, who does that, man? Go, find me someone that does that. Go, oh, wait. You know what I'm saying? And then the point is not that he had just a good heart, but I think that the really the takeaway here is this is a guy whose heart was in the right place. It wasn't about anything but what was best for jiu-jitsu. You see, you see the commitment? Like, no, no, as long as jiu-jitsu is evolving, it doesn't matter that I'm broke. It doesn't matter I don't have anything to hold on to. It doesn't matter. Like, it's as long as jiu-jitsu is evolving. That's what he wanted above everything else. It was never about him. It was never about, like, oh, I want to be glorified. I want to be put on a pedestal. I want to be, you know, a martyr of this or that. Like, I, it was about, like, what is best for jiu-jitsu? And his heart was always in the right place. So... Can anyone say that they've done more for jiu-jitsu than him? At a time where there was, it's like you see these people jumping into jiu-jitsu today, right? It's like the guy who becomes like a professional athlete and all these people come at him because now he has money. And it's like, well, who are your friends when you had nothing? Well, those are the real ones. Now, everyone's a question mark because now you're popular and rich. So every new person that comes in your life is a question mark. Or how real are they? Are they there for you or for themselves? And I think... You just you get that now. You get all these people saying, I did it, I did it, I did it. Like, no, man, you walked into the sport last week. Shut up. 
You know, there's like there's hundreds of thousands of people that dedicated their lives to jiu-jitsu and there was nothing to gain. Those are the people who did it, you know, and I think Carlson is the leader of that move. Like he is the guy who, you know, put his foot down. It's like, we're going to open this up. We're going to make this the greatest martial art in the world. We're going to make it the most efficient martial art in the world. And, you know, even the UFC, there's arguments that could be made that that was that was him. That was him pushing for it, because you got to remember, Horian made it to the United States in the late 70s. He didn't create the UFC until 93. Why did it take him so long? So much so that he sold it the first opportunity he had. He sold it as soon as he could sell it. He sold it for a million dollars. So that was that really his passion. Like you talk to these old timers, like Carlson, his whole life, he would say, the way to promote jiu-jitsu to the world is through Valetudo slash MMA. Mm-hmm. So he knew that that was the window. So it was like in some ways, after that 91 Valetudo, things are moving in Brazil. And Carlson's the one saying Valetudo is the way to promote jiu-jitsu because he had lived it in the 50s and 60s before it was banned in brazil and he knew what how many he knew what kind of crowd it could draw i remember in the 50s these these mma fights are drawing crowds of like tens of thousands of people they're big numbers right so you know this i, I think this is these are our key pieces of this history but they're not it's information that's not out there mm-hmm. so people are missing it and it's like and then they have this complete all these misconception about how jiu-jitsu came about and why we're here and who did what and i'm like wait a second guys there's a there's a distinction here between marketing and merit. And that, that, that bothers me, man. Like I, I, I don't mind when I see someone more accomplished than myself, I always applaud them, man. Every time I see like Bushesha, I'm like, holy shit, man, that guy's got 13 world titles. That's so badass. Uh huh. I, I see like the other day, you know, I, I see Bruno Malfacini. Like, I don't even know the guy. Never spoke to him. Every time I see him, holy shit, the guy's got 10 world titles in the same division. Uh huh. Man, let that sink in. For 10 years, for a decade, no one can beat you in your weight class. That's crazy to me. You know, so I know I, I, I'm I, not, you know, but, and I don't, I, I'm happy for them because I know how hard it is. But when I see people talking their way into like did this, and I'm like, man, I just, I don't like it. It just bothers me. It's like, man, you didn't do it. Mm-hmm. You want it? You want it? Go put the work in. Do it. You know, and there's a lot of people in this story that pat themselves on the back. And they actually, if you actually look at what they've done, it's like, show me. Show me what you've actually done other than just like talking about it. You know, and and I, this is like, I think this just reinforces my admiration for, for Carlson and the practitioners from the second wave. Hey guys, Josh McKinney here. Just wanted to tell you really quickly about Efficient Strength for BJJ. We have released a, oh, sorry, Efficient Strength for BJJ in 15 minutes. We have released a brand new instructional uh, on what weightlifting program I've kind of followed all throughout my jujitsu. My dad, who is 60 plus a black belt, was awarded his black belt at 60 years old. He also has followed this same lifting routine. Me as an adult athlete, him as a senior citizen almost. And we're following the same weightlifting routine. It takes 15 minutes a week for us. For some people, it may take two workouts, so it may be 30 minutes a week at first. But regardless, what person is claiming that they can take 15 to 30 minutes of your time, your focus, your intention, and turn that into injury prevention, turn that into more strength, turn that into better cardio, and just turn it into all around feeling better. And that is what this product provides. If you guys are interested in that, be sure to check this product out at simplifyingjujitsu.com slash 15. That's simplifyingjujitsu.com slash 15. And for right now, when you buy this instructional, you also get the option of what we call the Steve Bundle. And that is my dad's two latest instructionals before this one, which would be train until 60 and beyond 60 moves that work until you are 60 and after. And the second one is how to learn jujitsu, an instructional that my dad and I did together. And those, if you buy them together, will be half off uh, once you purchase, once you purchase efficient BJJ strength in 15 minutes. That's all I have for you guys. Let's get back into this episode. When you see, how old are you, Robert? Uh, I'll be 42 next month. Okay, so when you see a guy uh, you you research the history. Um, you see where you specifically are at. Uh, um, had a phenomenal competition career. Uh, have a gym. Have a lot of 
voice in jujitsu right now. Um, and you know what you know now. Obviously, you write the books. Obviously, you come on podcast. What else is kind of your next? What what is kind of the future for you in in a sense of growing jujitsu? Because obviously, when you're looking at guys that grew jujitsu, um, I would just assume to some extent you go, okay, well, this is what they did. This is what you know. This is what we could play off of. Or is there not that thought at all? Is it like, you know? caring more about growing uh, your jujitsu or your team? Where's kind of your thoughts, knowing what you know now uh, as to just what the future holds for you? Uh, man, like I'm busy. I, I really wish I had more time to write. And like I between teaching classes, managing the gym, just being an adult, you know, paying bills and, you know, fixing broken things and like the other day, like the shelf in my inventory room fell. It took me a whole afternoon to fix it. Oh man, I could be writing a book right now. Here I'm fixing a shelf, you know. Like it just it, as an adult, it's hard to find free time, mm -hmm. you know. But I I, I want to write more. I got a lot of things that I want to write about. Um, one of them is like I I'm I'm brainstorming a book about coaching. I think there are a lot of things about a lot of misconceptions about coaching and what is good coaching and what works and what doesn't work. And I think people go a lot by fashion and fads. Um, you ever watch that movie Moneyball? I love that movie. Mm -hmm. I so do. basically, like the guy revolutionizes uh, baseball because people used to hire, you know, based on fads and you know trends and whatever. And this guy's this guy goes, like, "What are the facts? Give me the facts. Give me the numbers." And I'll. And then you know, it was obvious when you think about it, but because no one did it, no one was doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that in going jujitsu, man. There's a lot of like people that are just doing things because everyone else is doing it, and I don't think they're efficient methods. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of social and political things that go on in, in, in regards to coaching that people don't talk about that I think are extremely important. I saw this in jujitsu. I saw this in MMA. And, and I think that there, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of room for improvement, you know, but, you know, for example, if you, if you go to an event and you win all the time, people, it's, it's correlation causation sort of thinking, right? So you win people because you drink beet juice every morning mm -hmm. oh i'm winning because i drink beet juice i was like no you idiot because your window is other things that you're not you taking into consideration it's not because of you know the 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 you know where your routine or whatever my point is like there's a lot of optimization that could be done in terms of training methodology that i don't think is being done but there's a lot of resistance to because people don't aren't used to doing it you know i think a lot of i mean you get this a lot from wrestlers i think i think they're right a lot of jiu-jitsu people train wrong and I agree. I think wrestlers train right, you know, but it's, it's, but it's, it's difficult to change that in the culture because they, they look at you like you're crazy. Like I think jujitsu, for example, suffers from an excess of techniques. It's a problem. It's got too many. It's like, oh, I, but yeah, the more, the better. It's like, not if you can't do any of them. Mm -hmm. And then people, oh, but I want to know all these techniques. So like, man, but what, what do you mean by knowing? What do you mean by knowing? Like you saw it? Okay. I saw Tiger Woods swing a golf club the other day. Can't play like him, but I saw him. But like I think people are on this mindset where if they, they just want new things all the time, but they're I think actually in some ways the level's going down. It's not going up because no one's the, the average practitioner does not spend enough time on anything to master anything. He just has all this loose information in his head, but there's a there's a there's some dissonance between what he knows theoretically and what he can execute in practice. There's some there's a there's a gap there that's not being filled by by actually intelligent training. And and I see this everywhere in jiu-jitsu. And so that I wanted to write about all that stuff. Um, I want to write one about like fight fight the psychology of fighting. Because it's a very I, I started writing that book a while back, but it's a very difficult book to write um because it's so you know unscientific, really. Yeah. It's just my opinions. You can't really put your finger and say this is the right mindset for a fighter. Mm -hmm. So it's just my opinion, you know, and then it, it, at the end of the day it just becomes a book of my opinions, right? But um that's what I, that those are the stuff that I want to get involved in. I, I think I can might be able to contribute something to the community that way. But and and finishing my documentary, of course, which is going to be finished. I'm it's just like it's hiccup after here's the thing, man. I walked into this completely inexperienced and mm -hmm. I completely underestimated the size of the pickle, you know, and and now I'm dealing with it. So but it's gonna be done. It's it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um 
man, there is so much that I, we could we could look at deconstruct. Let, let, let's go with this. Um, just kind of touched on that. Uh, jujitsu training method is broken. Um, you're learning jujitsu, understanding, actually being good at jujitsu seems to be broken. And I, uh, you're not the first coach that has come on and and said that. Uh, it really yeah. seems like that's that is true. That so many people want to just throw more technique at it like it is going to fix things or they think of things as oh this technique is new or this technique yeah. is innovative and this is going to be the fix and as coaches as competitors we know that that is never the answer um yeah. and so what would be you made a statement about wrestling has it right jujitsu has it wrong could you just give a little more context on that i there's a chapter in the book it's at the end of the book um it's called you know it's it's I can't remember the name of the chapter, but it's like it's basically drawing a distinction between how what should guide uh, jujitsu's evolution is simple and efficient, not sophisticated and um, you know complicated moves or you know because I think people are starting to think jujitsu is like an iPhone, right? That the new iPhone is better than the old one, right? And I hate using these words old and new because you get into this old school versus new school conversation, which is not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is you should measure things by how efficient they are, right? Not by how popular, how cool, you know, if you look at like in the eighties, like, you know, there are a lot of like Taekwondo schools doing like those spinning kicks and they're beautiful. I still think, I think Kata is beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. I think spinning kicks are beautiful. I think Van Damme's moves are still badass to watch, but that shit doesn't work in a fight. Let's be honest. It's one in a million. And I think jujitsu is kind of going that same direction, you know, going back to that cyclical thing that we were talking about. Um, and, and to me, it's it's about efficiency. And in my experience, simple, whether it's old or new, I don't care about. It's simple is normally correlated with efficiency. Like the, the analogy I use these days, I'm I'm not a huge gun guy, but people who love guns love the AK-47 because it's so simple. An AK-47 is easy to fix. It's easy to trade, like, you know, replace the parts, fires in the rain and the sand and the snow, doesn't jam. It's just a very efficient gun because it's simple. Its mechanics are simple. You know, and I I, I kind of look at jiu-jitsu like that. And you want a jiu-jitsu that's an AK-47 because there's less parts to break. And I think that was Carlson's vision. And it was always what I believed in as well. You know, jiu-jitsu should be um, less, the less add-ons, the better. If we need to add something, do it. But I don't think we have to, you know. And I think as you move up the ranks, then it's fine if you have more add-ons because you have the experience to do it, you have the foundation to do it. But what we have is, you know, white belts and blue belts trying to add all these gadgets to their jiu-jitsu, and they don't have the foundation. They're, like, missing out a lot of the core elements, like basic jiu-jitsu. And I'm not talking about old school. I'm not talking about fundamentals. I'm talking about simple things like don't fall on your back if you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Like, don't, like, and, and, and we're missing that because, man, I have my white belts and blue belts are trying to do buggy chokes all the time. They're not even trying to shrimp. They're letting their opponent pass their guard. You know, and I, I think to some extent, I think, you know, the Internet has played a role in this Instagram because what, what rises to the surface is what, what what's cool, what's shiny. Mm -hmm. And and people, we're, we're, we have herd mentality. We all do. We're, we're all we like to say, though, I'm not a sheep. We're all sheep. We follow numbers because it's easier. It's convenient to follow numbers. You don't have to thank you that someone else is the thinking for you because thinking is exhausting. It's time consuming. So it's easier to follow trends. So if you see someone liking a move a million times and you see this other move with 10 likes, it's easy to say, oh, this one clearly is better. It's been approved by a million people. Was well, that the case? Not necessarily, right? But And I, I think that what's rising is is the sophisticated for sophistication's sake, not necessarily efficient. As a result, we're not we're, we're distancing, not only distancing ourselves from the reality of combat, it's getting harder and harder for people to learn jiu-jitsu because they're overwhelmed with so much information. Now, going back to wrestling, I'm not a wrestler. I've never wrestled, but I've seen people train. I mean, they have four things they practice, like five. It's like a it's like boxers, the same as boxers. They have like six punches they practice over and over. And that's it. And Floyd Mayweather still works the same punches every day. He doesn't complain. You know, like jujitsu has a lot more layers to it than boxing and wrestling. In my opinion, it's more complex. It's like it's got more dimensions. But... I think that we swung so hard the other way because we're coming to associate, you know, knowing the move with this is what good jujitsu is. And yeah, I don't think that's good for the student. I think it's detrimental because 
he needs to actually get good at one of them or two mm-hmm. of them, you know, but as, as it's taught right now, there's not enough emphasis on anything for them to learn anything. They're just going through these moves and not really absorbing anything. You know? I, yes, that makes complete sense to me. I think that, uh, I see so many people who will be a blue belt and not watch a move being taught because they know the move. And me as a black belt, I've done jujitsu for 15 years, competed a bunch. I will learn a shrimp or a bridge and roll from a really high level guy and come away with a detail from it. Yeah. And I know how to shrimp. I know how to get out, but it, it is that, that level of arrogance maybe of, yeah. of, of that. Um, and that is kind of where I wanted to push the conversation towards to the end at the end is, is this idea of, um, what you put as the Instagram era of jujitsu, this era of jujitsu where flashy, spinny things that may work, may not just rise to the top. And that's what is on everybody's mind in the jujitsu world as just as a practitioner, not as a, Hey, let's fix the world, but just as a guy, um, that would be coming up right now, is there any way that they can know what they're learning is actually useful to them? You, you have to trust your instructor, but the things, a lot of instructors are also being, you know, they're not really standing their ground. They're like conceding to the fads, you know? Um, I think the mistake really, you know, I'll go back to the advice to the beginners in a second, but I think the problem started. I remember when this started, when I first became aware of the problem, it might've started way before that, but I remember like maybe like 10 years ago when the whole submission only thing started and I looked at the rule set and I go, this is not going to work. And I'm like, why? Because you're going to tell people that position is not important. They're just going to just like learn how to get out of submissions, escape to, to over time not really give a shit about takedown sweeps, which is exactly what's happening. Like there's no position and in a fight positioning matters. You know, if you watch the UFC, I don't know the numbers, but I suspect there are more TKOs on the ground than submissions. So positioning is important in a fight, mm-hmm. but when you neglect positioning, what happens is you're saying, Oh, it's all about the submission. That's what they say. It's all about the submission. And I'm like, eh, not really in a fight, you know, it's position matters. Um, but like, I remember when I would say that to people, and this is what people would reply. This is still people's answer. But Rob, it's so fun to watch. It's entertaining. Mm-hmm. Entertaining. And I'm like, and I, I remember thinking the first time I heard that, I remember thinking to myself, entertaining? What does what does what does jujitsu have to do with entertainment? Like, mm-hmm. why do, why are these those two words even in the same sentence? Jujitsu and entertainment. They're they're not. Jiu-jitsu is not about entertainment. It's about efficiency. You see, Hoist did Hoist Gracie did not shock the world in '93 because he was entertaining. He shocked the world because he was efficient and he was doing and honestly till this day as much as i love jiu-jitsu i still think those flying kicks are way prettier to look at than transitions on the ground they're mm-hmm. flashier i think i think spinning kicks are beautiful and that's really cool but i think it's just cool i don't want to spend my time doing that because i'm not interested in cool as a fighter as a martial artist i'm interested in efficient and when they would say that it's entertaining it's like man i realized that the north Right, that their their guiding principle had been, had shifted something had shifted because when I started training jujitsu, it was about efficiency. Jujitsu is the most efficient martial art in the world. It works in a fight. Right, we were meant to dominate the jujitsu world, MMA world. We don't anymore, and that's our fault because the community completely drifted off track. Whatever, that's a different discussion. But it was about efficiency. No, no one ever talked about entertainment. The word entertainment wasn't even like oh whatever. If you like it, you do. If you don't, you're stupid because this stuff works. Yeah. It was about efficiency. Above all, all of a sudden became about entertainment. Because we're, I think it was Dave Chappelle who was saying something. He was making that point. We're a civilization so obsessed with like entertain me, entertain me, like novelty, novelty, novelty. It's like, yes, yes, that's what it is. Because like we're so, I was scrolling through our phones and we want interesting things every three seconds. And we don't have the attention span to watch a 30 second video anymore, you know? And, 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 and people just keep raising the bar. Like, and this is why I start my book with a circus. I'm making a point. I start the the books with a circus. And it's I feel like we're gone full circle. We're going back to making the fight world a circus. You're seeing all these funny skits that they do in the cage. They're bringing all these comics to kind of make jujitsu and MMA funny and like more entertaining because you got to keep raising the bar because the crowd wants more and more and more. It's like more bread and circus. There's no end to that. So you you kind of you, you kind of put efficiency in, in, in the back seat and you put entertainment in the, in, in the driver's seat 
And and I think that's that's bad for the credibility of a martial art, even if it's good for money. That's the other thing. Like money is the guiding north. This is why Carlson is so relevant, because he didn't look at money as the most important thing. It's like, what is best for jiu-jitsu? I like money. I'm not being a hypocrite to say that I don't, but I think that to place entertainment and profit as the highest achievement for a martial art is the beginning of the end. A popularization, fads, uh, entertainment, you know, all these things, like if you're placing that as the metric of success, you're on your way down. You're not on your way up, you know, and because credibility is credibility is 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 the key factor here. Um, you know, what doesn't change in the history of martial arts is whether it's efficient or not. You know, like that right there, that's that's fads come and go. We know that, you know, you're wearing like a certain amount of pay, like it's like certain kind of pants and shoes today. Ten years from now, that's hideous. Mm-hmm. The shirt you're wearing today might be cool today. Ten years from now, it's hideous. It's embarrassing. You know, that's how fashion is. It comes and goes, but there's certain things that don't change over time. And in terms of martial arts, what doesn't change, what's immutable, right? There's always the efficiency of combat. And if you lose that as your guiding principle, you're on your way down. White belts are not even aware of this discussion because it's not being brought to them. They're going on Instagram. They're going, well, this is what Instagram says. But again, white belts are like, no offense to white belts, but they're like children. They don't know better. So you got to kind of guide them. You don't tell it. You don't tell a child like, oh, eat whatever you want. You know, if as a parent, you go like, all right, this is broccoli. This is a donut. Donuts will make you fat. Broccoli will make you healthy. You know, oh, but dad, I went broke donut. No, shut up. You don't get the donut. You get broccoli. That's it. Because you're mm-hmm. chill. You're, 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 you don't know better. White belts need to be, and, and it sounds arrogant to say that, but they need more guidance. Like you got to tell them what to do because they don't know better. You don't give them like, oh, choose whatever you want. But that's what's happening with the internet. It's democratized just so much. A white belt who started training last week, his click has the same weight as my click. You see, those clicks are equated because a click is a click. It's an equal vote. Well, I've been doing this for 26 years, the highest level, but my click is not better than the click of someone who's been training for a week. And that right there, there's that the sense of order and hierarchy gets disrupted in that environment. So people don't know the difference between up and down, left and right anymore. So what's what? It, where are we going? Who's who? Jiu Jitsu is in the hands of who? I would like to say the IBJJF, but I, in some ways it's not. In some ways it's in the hands of the internet, which is this wild animal, led by people who don't know what they're talking about. Like half the time, you know, they don't. They're not even thinking that way because they want entertainment, 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 and they're going to turn the fight world into a circus. Which is, we're kind of seeing that man. Like when I saw these funny skits, you know, when I see them inside the cage. Or on the mats, and they're trying. I'm like, okay, that's funny to watch, but you know that right there is not going to stop, right? Because you have to raise the bar now. You can't just do it once and forget about it. You just got to. Everyone's trying to outdo it because if it's all about the clicks, you and it's like journalism. You want serious journalism, you're not going to sell a lot of newspapers. But if you're the National Enquirer, it's the number one sold tabloid in the country, National Enquirer. You got to be sensationalist. You got to be over the top. You got to lie. You got to distort. You got to give them more and more and more. And there's no end for that appetite. So you shouldn't have that appetite in the driver's seat. Wow. <laughs> that is, uh, man, that, that makes so much sense. Do you think, is there a remedy for it? No, because it's not a jujitsu problem. It's a world problem. Yeah. It's a world problem. The jujitsu no, people, I can attack my community or my, my own standing, and I'm part of the problem here. I'm not part of the solution. I'm just, you know, I when I was writing this, I'm conflicted the whole time I'm writing this book because I feel like a hypocrite because I make a living from this democratization. And I make a comfortable living because of it. And I, like, would I sacrifice my comfortable living? I'm like, I don't shake, I would. I don't know. But you have to put me on, on, on the spot. And I, I, I would uh-huh. say I wouldn't. You know, but I'm conflicted because I know we're going in the wrong direction or direction that in some in some ways, not in all ways, but you know, I would I would definitely prefer it to be, you know, a more of a a, a tougher practice. Like the world's gotten softer, you know, and, and the, there's no more sense of merit and in, in a hierarchy, you know, like like it's 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 gotten it's it's changed a lot, man. The world I mean, even like I'm 41 and I'm like I could see a lot of changes. Like I remember things when I was a kid or it was unthinkable to talk back to a black belt or challenge him or you see on the internet, it happens every day, every mm-hmm. day, every day people do it. You know, the keyboard warriors. And it's like, but they're the majority. It's like people like, I want to have an opinion, man, like let the experts be, but we don't do that. Like when I was a kid, you would never talk over uh, someone older than you. 
It's like if someone older is talking, you shut up and you don't interrupt them. You don't, you know, and I, you know, I'm not saying I've never done this, but I think those things were at least they were present in the world. You know, they were, they were established. They're no longer part of the conversation. You know, um, I don't know. I don't think what you can do about it. I, mean, I think, you know, we have, we have to adapt because the world's changing, but I, at the very least, man, and while I'm writing this and while I'm conflicted with all this, I keep telling myself, at least I'm going to register the moment, bear witness, like 50 years from now, hundred years from now, if people, whatever happens to jujitsu, if people want to, okay, so what happened? I'm like, okay, this, during this moment here, this is what happened. And I, and I think the book accomplished that to some extent. It, it, it does mark the changes, you know, there's a chapter in there that's autobiographical and that chapter was not going to make it. It was actually a footnote from the previous chapter that grew into a autobiographical chapter. And the reason it made it in there, I wasn't going to place it, but like the people who read it said, no, you should put it because you should keep it in the book because it, um, it, it shows why you admire a certain view of jujitsu that has died and no longer exists. So the things that it drew, what drew me to jujitsu initially no longer exist and they're even frowned upon right but at least that chapter explains why i stand by what i stand even though i am indulgent in the moment as well as contradictory as that may sound that the, yes i i totally understand though i i get i get where you're coming from with that uh, i think i started in 08 and so i kind of came up in this last era, you know, um, and yeah. really got to witness the guys that were black belts ahead of me. There is no doubt that the, the way people are treated is totally different. The way higher level guys are yeah. treated is totally different. Um, just the amount of, you know, I always notice it in the jujitsu world, the you suck mentality of, oh, this guy lost to this guy. So he's not any good. And people missing yeah. out on the point of like, Hey, these are the most elite guys that we have doing jujitsu right now. And so, yeah. yes, they can beat each other and it is, you know, it is no big deal. And I remember that being in my generation um, and being normal. And then now it is not that it is a, you yeah. know, it really is a, a difference in jujitsu. Um, yeah. 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 So, no, you're right. I agree. Yeah. So last um, just kind of, to, to finish out this, we always tend to finish with the same question. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about um, the book, but we've also kind of bounced around and, and talked about a lot of different things. Uh, but I always like to finish with this. Uh, I know you have, how long have you done jujitsu for? Uh, going on 26 years. So 26 years. So in 26 years, um, what is the best, or at least what springs to mind when I ask you, what is the best piece of jujitsu advice that you have ever gotten? Man, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think. I mean, I'm sure I've received many good pieces of advice. I'm going to try to... I don't think everyone, anyone ever explicitly gave me this advice, but it was something that it was, it was, it was unsaid. It was an unwritten code, right? It was in between the lines. It was never written on a wall. No one ever worded it, but it was part of the culture. And it's man, like enjoy the moment. You know, I think a lot of people that get on the jujitsu journey, they on this thing where, Oh, when I get that blue belt, I'll be happy. It's kind of like in life, you know, you're always thinking that the next big thing is going to make you happy. When I buy that car, you know, when I buy that house, when I get that new job, when I get that black belt, when I win that world title. And these things are never, it's, you're, it's always disappointing, man. Like, and I think you need things to aspire to. Like, I think it's good you're looking forward to something. I don't think you should be this, this melancholic thing, just sitting on the couch going, life is meaningless. What's the point? You know? If you are like that, you should fight that and not want to be that way. I think we've all been there at that point. It's some, you know, it's normal. You you question like, what what am I doing this for? You know, what's the point? You know, you know it's not going to gratify you. But so instead of thinking about the world title or the belt, like man, think about those moments on the mats with your friends afterwards. That laughter, like you get those moments every day, but they kind of fly over. We don't really appreciate them, you know. Sometimes. You know, but that's that's what I take from jujitsu, man. It's just like I really taken a lot of like I met amazing people. I've traveled the world because of jujitsu. Um, 
and but my my, my but that's my favorite thing man it's just like those those the the, the day-to-day moments on the mass with my friends good laugh afterwards you know that's figure the jamagalians to the fullest right there sitting around you know in a circle laughing after a good you know hard rounds and but that they take that man that's the treasure and if you keep that and if it's a happy environment and you're around happy people you are you know you're, you're it's easy to come back and that's how you get better is by coming back every day so if you're happy and you're in a happy environment and you want to journey enjoying the journey that's right in front of you not thinking too far ahead not thinking about the reward but the actual daily sacrifices you know the daily sacrifices that you make you know like training when you're tired or when you're injured or just being with your those things are very valuable man like it's it's the daily little little things that make the journey meaningful because i'm telling you man you're gonna win that world title it's not gonna you're gonna build that dream gym i'm gonna have a thousand students and like you celebrate it for a few days and all that and afterwards it's like man you feel empty again you know and that's just how it is and it's not going to change and I, i'm old enough to realize that that there's no such thing as ever going to truly gratify me so i just like make an effort to just like enjoy every little moment with my children and students and or by myself with a good book you know whatever the case and that's a good piece of advice robert thank you for being on the show man uh thank you man it was a pleasure anything you want to say to finish um yeah if you're ever in vegas um i'm not very political when it comes to jujitsu um you um everyone you know i I teach classes daily morning and evening stop by i'm somewhat active on instagram i don't spend a lot of time on there but you know write me there if you write me on facebook i'm probably not going to reply i don't go on facebook or twitter but if you write me on instagram i'll probably reply um yeah stop by the gym Check out the book. You can buy them on my, on my website, closedguardfilm.com, or you can buy them on Amazon. We have Audible, Kindle, and Print, whatever you prefer. And, uh, yeah, keep at it, man. Keep at it, you know. Find a find a good people. Find a good school and be a good team player. Don't think you're special. You're not special. You're just part of the chain, man. Like, the stronger that chain is, the better for you. So be a good team player, man. There's, we it's gotten that's the other thing i don't like it's gotten too individualistic man you don't see a lot of team players anymore you know be a team player man thank you you. thank you so much robert thanks for being on the show thank you and that is the episode i just want to thank you guys for checking this one out uh thanks again to robert drysdale for just dropping a lot of knowledge i really really uh just to got enjoyed that conversation i i noticed afterwards i thought more about that conversation than i do about do with most conversations that we have on the show uh it's just really cool to get to talk to a guy who knew his history that way and i feel like the perspective that he shares with that history is really interesting the um the care of of jujitsu and, and obviously uh robert was very very forthcoming he's like hey i care about money too you know i think that he was wrong uh carlson was wrong not caring about money at all uh but you know you look at that and you look at guys contributing to the art contributing to jujitsu um i just think uh Robert is doing a great job of that in my era of jujitsu. And so uh, very appreciative of that. Very appreciative of him being on the show. The um, I'm very appreciative of you guys. The amount of efficient BJJ strength in 15-minute courses that we have sold is is it's it's actually a lot more than i expected to sell um especially considering we really haven't been sending out many emails about it and really haven't been pushing it we haven't pushed it on any social media or anything like that it's just been running commercials and you guys have been trusting us enough after 200 plus episodes to to buy that course and and to buy the courses that we have i also have some um hopefully within the next couple weeks i will be able to share them with you guys i will have some purchasable seminars that i've done over the last month and a half that are to me like some really good stuff most of it's on guard passing it's all on playing top i don't really i haven't taught any seminars on playing bottom in quite a while uh but it's all on playing top and it's very unique stuff obviously 
it's a seminar. It's not a uh, completed simplifying jujitsu product like we will be making when we make the Trinity of Guard passing or whatever the heck that instructional is going to be called. It is halfway finished. I know that I've been telling you guys I was going to start on it for years. That instructional is halfway finished. But to kind of hold you over, I thought since I'm teaching these seminars, since we have the footage, why not share it? And so um, they're kind of interestingly film i think it is uh i teach very differently and uh, you will get to experience that some but then i think a lot of the way that i teach is best understood in the question and answer when people are trying to get more context and best understood in the live rolling and so i make sure that if i live roll at these seminars that i include some of my live roles and I really make sure to include all the Q&A, um, me even walking around and helping the individual groups with their individual moves, I include all that. And what this will do is it'll be a really fun watch. Uh, I always bring the energy just like I try to on the podcast. Um, but uh, I think that you guys will like them. I have uh, three different ones that are on chest over chest guard passing. They all slightly cover different topics. And then I have one um, that is about upper body control. It's called the pinch. And that is about, well, it's really hard to even explain what anything that I teach you guys is about or anything I teach jujitsu wise. It's about how to control somebody. Um, it's about how to use that control effortlessly. And it's about what the best guys in the world are doing right now and making it really simple to understand. And so those will be out very soon, probably within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'll make sure to let you guys know when they, those are out. Um, if you want to be quickly updated, be sure to be signed up for the Gee Gazette. The only way to do that is if you go to simplifyingjujitsu.com slash three and sign up for the three lenses ebook. That's all I have for you guys today. Hope you enjoyed today's episode and I hope that today's episode helps you guys suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. Have a great day, guys.